of a better song to introduce our lesson this morning. For those that are visiting, we have been studying the book of Joshua. And this morning will lead us to chapters 9 and 10. The title of our lesson this morning is The Saga of the Gibeonites. We have three points. Number one, errors with no prayers. Number two, spoken words do not disturb. And number three, hail stones or hail Jehovah. Let's go to our text. In Joshua chapter 9, we pick this up after the great battle and victory at Jericho, after another great battle and victory at Ai. And we read in verse 1 of chapter 9. Now when all the kings west of Jordan heard about these things, those in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of the great sea, as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites, they came together to make war against Joshua and Israel. Now it's very interesting right here to see that the enemies of God were so afraid of God's people. They said, man, we've got to bond together. The word in the international version says they came together. Another translation says they were of one accord to make war against Joshua and the Israelites, literally, the Hebrew right there is, with one mouth. In other words, it wasn't just in their heart. They were expressing, we are going to war right here, amen? And it's kind of interesting how when the truth starts to be victorious, that the enemies of God's people start to align themselves. We saw this in Luke chapter 23 and verse 12, where Herod and Pontius Pilate, who were enemies, came together when Jesus Christ was a threat to them. And so the enemies of God's people are now in one accord and ready to go up against Joshua and the Israelites. We read on. Verse 3. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. The men put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. Let's just stop right here. We find right here that one of the smaller groups of the Hivites, those people that lived in Gibeon, had heard about all the great things that the Lord had done, not only with Jericho and Ai, but on the eastern side of the Jordan. And it says, man, we cannot stand against their God. We have got to figure out a way to go with them. They knew that the God of the Israelites had commanded that all the people in the promised land be completely slain. And it says, man, we've got to come up with a cranking plan right here. And it's kind of interesting how the fear of God produces two different responses. The one response is, of course, we are going to battle and the other one says, man, we've got to join them anyhow, anyway. And so they come up with this ruse, and they, even though they lived just a short ways away, they got old clothes and old sandals, and even they got old moldy bread, and they made the wineskins look like they were old and had gone a distance by putting little patches on them, and, and then they looked like they came from a long ways. And they find the Israelites at Gilgal. Now, some people want to attack the Bible on certain issues. And this is one of them about Gilgal. They're saying, how could Joshua and the gang be back at Gilgal? Of course, we remember that earlier. But simply the explanation is it's the second Gilgal. Well, just like in America, we have two Portlands, do we not? We have Portland, Maine. We have Portland, Oregon. And of course, the, the origin of that is very simple. When two of the main families came out to Portland, Oregon, this is a true story, one of the families was from Portland, Maine, and the other family from Boston, Massachusetts. And they said, well, I want the name to be Portland. No, I want the name to be Boston. See, let's flip a coin. They flipped the coin. It became Portland, Oregon. Amen, guys? So it could have been two Bostons, but two Portlands. Amen? And so right here in the Bible, we have two Gilgals right here. And so they come to the men of Israel. So we've come from a distant country. Make a treaty with us. Now, we know in Exodus chapter 23 
verse 32 and following, that God explicitly forbids there to be any treaty made with the people in the promised land because it says, hey, if you allow those people to live amongst you, you in time will be pulled into them and you will be ensnared by their sin and ensnared by their gods. So in verse 7 we read, The men of Israel said to the Hivites, But perhaps you live near us. How then can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked, Who are you and where do you come from? They answered, Your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all they did in Egypt, and all they did to the two kings of the Amorite east of Jordan, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in the Astra. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, Take provisions for your journey. Go and meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now, see how dry and moldy it is? And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by a very long journey. The men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live. And the leaders of the assembly ratified it by an oath. Three days after they made a treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out, and on the third day came to their city, Gibeon, Tepharath, Periath, Kiriath, Jerem. But the Israelites did not attack them, because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Point one. Errors with no prayers. You know, it's very interesting. Here are these men that had come. They had old clothes, old sandals, old food. And from one perspective, it was obvious they were from a distant country. Look at how they looked. Then they said, we better taste the provisions. And so they tasted the stuff. Said, man, look at their clothes. Taste the food. Obviously, these guys are from a long ways off. Let's just go ahead and sign the treaty with us. And wouldn't you know it, three days later, that's about always the time you hear about things, about three days later, they said, oh my goodness, they live very close. And they are indeed peoples of the promised land. You see, right here, it's very interesting to me that not only Joshua, but all the men of Israel were deceived by their senses. Their intuitive senses said, yes, these men, they're from a distant land. But how often Satan can deceive us by what we see, what we taste, and whatever our senses detect. The Bible teaches that in all decisions, we need to take it to God. We need to take it to God. You know, I appreciate uh, our, our dear sister, Tracy Hardy. And this is a sister that just steps up. I mean, she's bold as a lion. And a couple of weeks ago, she would say, man, I, I really want to get a visitor tonight to Bible talk. I really want to get somebody on out. So she goes to Sam's Club. And at Sam's Club, she goes, Lord, give me a visitor for tonight. And she looks over here, and there's a, there's a gentleman over there, and she says, no, that might not be very cool for me to ask him. And I really respect Tracy. She's, she's a person that's really hard line about her purity. And so she went about her business. She bought everything, and on the way on out, everything in the sack spilled on out. And the guy that was sitting way over there comes running all the way on over, and he starts picking up everything. And she goes, okay, Lord, I know I'm supposed to share with this guy now. And so she says to him, well, what are you doing tonight? He says, why, do you want to go out on a date? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I want to invite you to church. I want to invite you to Bible talk, you know. And so he came to church last week. Is that awesome? You see, right here, I mean, Tracy depended on the Lord. Now, she was hard about her purity, and we all need to do that. Amen, brothers and sisters? But it was clear God wanted this young man to be asked. You know, I believe that in any decision you make without prayer, no matter how obvious it looks, that's where errors come. And as we'll see a little bit later in the lesson, 
one's errors, one's follies, one's sins, not only can have repercussions for the short term, but literally generations of people can be hurt by your folly of no prayer. If we are to be the people of God, then we've got to be a people devoted to prayer, to stay in touch with Him about little decisions and big decisions. You know, one of the biggest decisions of Elena's and my life, we knew we'd have to make last summer. When the Johnsons had moved to Portland and they were gaining their spiritual strength back, it was obvious that Steve and Lisa could take Portland. And as we really felt the need for there to be a new movement whose dream was to evangelize the world in a generation, we said, we've got to go to a bigger city where there's a lot of campuses and a lot of young people that could be converted to Jesus Christ and be raised up and be sent all around the world to all the nations. Yeah. At that particular time, all the brothers and we ourselves thought, well, it really just comes down to two large cities in America. It's either New York or Los Angeles. And for some reason, you know, I said, oh, yeah, New York would be cranking. I mean, it's awesome. I mean... Manhattan, 7 million people. What an incredible thought. And I told Lance, I said, we need to have a fleece to know where God would send us. And so we came up with the fact that we would go wherever there'd be a remnant group that would come on out and say, listen, we want to be aligned with the Portland family of churches. And so we started praying. Now, in my mind, I said, it's going to be New York. Because we were in contact with a person in New York, actually northern New Jersey, who had contacted us at Matt Sullivan over in Phoenix, and he had said, hey, you know, we used to be a region of 1,000. We're less than 500. It's says, I lead a little group of 30. We've only had one baptism all last year, and, and it was with our group, but he fell away. And we're really looking for hope. I'm going, oh, man, this is a person that's surely going to come on in and unite with us. Well, shortly after that, he just kind of disappeared. And all of a sudden... Ron Harding and Sal Velasco say, hold it, we need to start something new in Los Angeles. I go, holy cow. And so the remnant group began down here. And I, but I kept thinking, well, now, now, Lord, there could be another remnant group in New York, and you give us a choice. But it became obvious by December that just wasn't to be. And God sent us to Los Angeles. And I, and I look back right now, I go, oh, my goodness, how stupid I was. I mean, here, Elaine and I have been in Los Angeles. We know the streets. We know how long it takes on the 405 to go one mile. We're, we're, we're familiar with the people, but, but the, the interesting thing, good and bad, we have relationships with a lot of people, and so we've come back changed, repentant, refreshed, and ready to preach Jesus Christ again in this city, to see that this city can be one for Jesus Christ, and from here, the whole world can hear about Jesus in this generation. And it, it's, it's really been, I mean, just blowing me away. That literally, just two months ago, we came with a, a group of disciples, about 42 disciples of Portland. Now, we have 90 souls out disciple members of the City of Angels International Christian Church. You see, when you inquire of God, God is going to answer you. God is going to... It may not be the obvious answer. But God will give you victory. See, there are errors with no prayers. Our second point, the spoken word. Do not disturb. Back in verse 15, we read, Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live. And the leaders of the assembly ratified it by an oath. It is interesting, as I noted before, that not only Joshua was deceived, but all the people of Israel. Can you imagine that? That literally all the people of God were deceived at the same time. Staggering, isn't it? Read on then in verse 18. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders. See, it's always the leader's fault. They don't want to take responsibility. <laughs> but all the leaders answered, We have given them an oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we'll do to them. We will let them live so that the wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continue, Let them live. But let them be woodcutters and water carriers for the entire community. So the leader's promise to them was kept. You know, for a lot of American disciples, this is a puzzling passage. We take so lightly giving a promise or giving our word to someone. 
I'll be very honest with you. Even in our congregation here, I was very concerned. And so last week at our Bible Talk Leaders meeting, I shared this passage with our Bible Talk Leaders. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Right here, Paul is sharing his heart with the church at Corinth. And he says in chapter 1, verse 16, I plan to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. When I planned this, did I do it lightly? Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say, yes, yes, and no, no. He says, listen, if I say I'm coming to you in Macedonia, I am flat coming to you. I don't make my plans lightly. No disciple should make their plans lightly. Are you with me right here? Now read on. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached to you by me, Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it's always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. He says, listen, I serve a faithful God. When he makes a promise, it's flat yes all the time. It's not yes and no. It's not maybe when you seek first the Lord and his kingdom, all these things. It's going to happen every time you do it. Are you with me here, church? And so he's saying, I am the amen. I am the so be it to the promises of God. Now, as disciples, we've got to really take a good, hard, long look at this. Our word needs to be as good as God's word because we represent God. So, when we say to someone, hey, let me have your phone number, I will call you. Then you call. When you say, hey, let's get together this week. Then you get together this week. When you tell your family, we're going to have family devotional once a week, then you have family devotional once a week. When you tell your wife, you're going to have tea time with her, then you have tea time with her once a week. Are you with me here, church? The man of God, the woman of God, should let his yes be yes, and his no, no, are you with me here, church? See, one of the areas that we talked about already, we've all agreed early on, those members of us here, that the entire City of Angels Church will be going up to the Jubilee. And whatever sacrifice it takes, time-wise, money-wise, whatever the sacrifice is, we're going to make it happen. And the other day I was talking to one of the brothers and he started saying, well, you know, I've got some challenges with work. I'm going, hold it, hold it. You said you were going. See, we've got to have some deep convictions that when we give our word, it is golden. It is as good as the word of God. That's an upward call, isn't it? You know, there's a lot to be learned from this passage about the leaders keeping their promise to the Gibeonites. There's a lot to be learned. You know, one thing that I think is, is, is very interesting is the wrong done by a neighbor doesn't vindicate us in being guilty of committing another wrong. And see, right here, when they were wrong in signing the treaty and the people were upset, what did you guys do? Not at all going, they did the same thing. The leaders took a stand and said, listen, this is what we have promised, and we are going to hold to it. Yes, the Gibeonites did a, trick them. That was wrong. That wasn't right. But two wrongs do not make a right. It would not have been right for Israel once they promised to spare them. Now, granted, they were just going to be water carriers and woodcutters. That's the lowest of the whole Israelite community right there. But you know something? At least you're living. Amen, guys? He says, once they gave that promise, they said, listen, we're going to keep our word. You know, it's very interesting. This, this concept of making a decision and owning it is, is one of the biggest challenges, I, I think, with so many disciples that are, quote, hurting today. I want to share a passage. Carlos is sitting right here in the front row that uh, he and I studied out on Friday just when we got together. Turn to Luke chapter 5. You know, there, there are many, many people that are crying out these days, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. And in the same breath they go, I want to be reconnected to God, I love God. 
Well, right here in this passage, I think we've got some keys about how to be healed. Amen? And, of course, that's, that's exciting news for us as individuals. Amen, church? And as we work with brothers and sisters who have been hurt, we need to know how do we get them healed? Let's look at the passage in context. In chapter 5, we read this in verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. So he's a sold-out disciple. He left everything. Amen, guys? Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained with disciples... Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? She said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now this passage unlocks a key that is vital at this hour. See, here at this party celebration for Matthew or Levi, after becoming a disciple, and we do need to celebrate everybody that becomes a disciple of Jesus. Amen, guys? We find that there's some murmuring in the crowd because there were tax collectors that were still doing tax collecting. There were some sinners out there. And the Pharisees are going, man, how can you celebrate this guy turning to God with these kind of people? And Jesus, Jesus turns to him and says, you know, it's not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Now, he's zinging the Pharisees right here. Because what Jesus is doing, he's saying, the Pharisees, okay, you see yourself as righteous. So you're healthy. You don't need the great physician. But, of course, they're not really healthy, are they? They just don't see that they're sick. You see, the sick people were equated as the sinners. And healing right here is what? It's repentance. You hear this cry, I need to be healed. I'm so hurt. I'm so hurt. I just need time to heal. No, 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 no. Jesus says right here, what you need to do is repent. No, you don't understand. I have been hurt by a whole bunch of other Christians. Well then, get healed in the way Jesus says to get healed. Repent. No, no, you don't understand. I'm the one that got sinned against. See, we need to have a a deep conviction. Two wrongs do not make a right. Granted, the Israelites messed up by signing the treaty, but they did right when they did not come back wrongly once they had signed the treaty against the Gibeonites. It is true. When someone hurts you, sins against you, is unjust. I mean, you are genuinely hurt. And in our sinful nature, we think it justified to have feelings and to strike back. But Jesus says right here, he says the way to be healed is to see yourself not as righteous. See, that's a lot of times when we get hurt. I'm the righteous one. But to see yourself as the sinner. See, the righteous, they're the Pharisees. The sinners, they know they're sick, and so they go, man, I need the great physician. I need Jesus. He says, you want to be healed? Then repent. Now, we understand that when it comes to non-Christians. Non-Christians, we study the Bible with them all the time, and they're hurting, they got problems. We say, okay, you've got to repent of your immorality, your drunkenness, your bitterness. We just nail them, and they get repent, and they're baptized, and they stand up here, they're fired up, and we say, hey, you're a new creation. It's no different for someone that's hurting in the Lord. See, once you understand, you've got to look not at how other people have hurt you, but at your own sin. You go, oh man, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against God many, many times. I've even sinned in response to this person. Once you own your sin, you go, oh, I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. And only God forgives. Amen, guys? And so once you say, okay, I need God to forgive me, then what are you going to do about the people that sinned against you? Well, you got to forgive them. See, we got to get a conviction that forgiveness 
is just as important to salvation as baptism is. We've got to get a deep conviction. And so once you understand that the path to healing has nothing to do with the other person, your healing is you and God. And once you're healed and you no longer have an attitude, you're no longer bitter, then it's going to blow their mind when you go back to say, Hey, bro, i got a way to heal you. And it's repentance. Isn't that amazing? But see, people are so blinded because once we're hurt, we think we're the righteous ones. And we don't need the great physician if we're righteous. Because we're healthy. But in fact, so often we become sick at that point once we're hurt. And we do need the great physician. And once you realize you need the great physician and you need forgiveness, then we cannot be the unmerciful servant and not forgive those who have sinned against us. You know, the saga of the Gibeonites is one that is picked up in the book of 2 Samuel. Let's go there. It was really powerful the way that Joshua and the leaders took a stand not to respond sinfully back to the Gibeonites, but to be righteous and hold to their words. But there was a time later that that did not happen. And we read in chapter 21 of 2 Samuel, these words in verse 1. During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord. See, whenever there's a famine, physically or spiritually, you know something's wrong. So there's a famine going on. David says, man, I'm talking to God. I'm talking to God. The Lord said, it is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. Wow. Saul broke the word, the promise of the earlier Israelite leaders in his zeal. Wow. And God said, that's why there's a famine in the land. That's why I'm not blessing you with the crops. And so David calls the Gibeonites in once he realizes there's a problem. And once more we see the principle we studied last week, sin in the camp. That our sin can hurt the whole Israelite community. Are you with me right there? And so the Gibeonites come forward and David says, what can we do to show our earnestness and, and our repentance for our sin against your people? In verse 5 we read, They answered the king, As for the man who destroyed us and plotted against us, so we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel. Let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed and exposed before the Lord at Gibeah of us all, the Lord's chosen one. So the king said, I will give them to you. The king spared Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath before the Lord between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. See, he, David kept his word. But the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Aiah, daughter of Rizpah, whom he had borne to Saul, together with the five sons of Saul's daughter Merah, whom she had borne to Adriel, son of Berazali, the Melodite. He handed them over to the Gibeonites, who killed and exposed them on a hill before the Lord. All seven of them fell together. They were put to death during the first days of the harvest, just as the barley harvest was beginning. Rizpah, daughter of Aiah, took sackcloth and spread out for her on a rock. From the beginning of the harvest, the rain poured down from the heavens on the body. She did not let the birds of the air touch any of them by day, or the wild animals by night. When David was told that Aiah's daughter Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had done, he went out and took the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from the citizens of Jephthah's Gideon. They had taken them secretly from the public square of Beth Shane, where the Philistines had hung them after they had struck down Saul on Gilboa. David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there, and the bones of those who had been killed and exposed them They were gathered up. They buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the tomb of Saul's father Kish at Zela in Benjamin and did everything the king commanded. After that, God answered prayer in behalf of the land and the church said, Amen. You see, so often we have a sense of, okay, I just want to say I'm sorry. You know, sometimes you, you, you've got to say, hold it. I need to prove my repentance. I need to prove my repentance. It wasn't long ago that a brother was saying, I want to come back to God. 
And I said, then you need to move out from that immoral relationship that you're in. You had to prove your repentance. A brother had stolen money from his job. I said, you've got to be willing to give the money back. You've got to prove your repentance. It's just not a spoken word. It's got to be with your heart and actions. Need to follow. Right here, David made good. In the midst of making good, we see a nobleness that is rare. We find right here that seven grandsons of Saul are killed because of his sin. You know, sometimes we, we're, we're so nearsighted in our lives, we don't realize that, that our lives are affecting other people. I mean, when Carlos and I got together, we talked about that. That is for good and for bad. And I just laid it on out. I said, Carlos, when you come back, when you come back to God, then you can bring a whole bunch of people with you. That's what God wants. Are you with me right here? And so right here, we see the nobleness of, of Rizpah. Even though those bodies were out there wasting away, she sat out there day and night, chasing off the birds, chasing off the wild animals. She was getting enough, nothing to file those bodies. David hears about it. He says, you know something? People have done me wrong. They've even done Israel wrong. And they're spiritually dead right now. But you know something? Let us honor them for the good they did. Her example got David to say, let's get the bones of Saul and Jonathan from the men of Jebus Gilead. Collect them. Let's collect the bones that Rizpah is guarding and let them be buried properly. And the Bible says, then God answered prayer on behalf of the land. How often do we fail to consider that our actions can affect many for evil, like Saul, or for good, like Rizpah. Her example of humility moved the king that moved the nation that in time moved God. You see the spoken word? Do not disturb. Let your yes be yes. And your no, no, amen? amen? Let's go to our final point back to the book of Joshua. In chapter 10, our last point, hail stones or hail Jehovah. Here we go. Verse 1. Now Adon Zadok, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king. And that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. Let's just stop right here. The actual Hebrew of Adon Zedek is the same as Melchizedek that we find back in Genesis 16. The guy that first, you know, gave the tithe or asked for the tithe. And he was, of course, the king of Salem. And some people think that the name Jerusalem comes from the fact that Melchizedek was the king of Salem, or Shalom, peace, and that he was of the tribe of the Jebusites. And so it's simply a corruption of Jebus-Shalom, Jerusalem. You see what I'm saying? That's thought. And right here we find that he is the leader of this new confederacy against the Israelites. Verse 2. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all of its men were good fighters. So Adon Jezedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Deber, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it's made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jeremoth, Lachish, and Eglon joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. The Gibeon then sent word to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us, because all the Ammonite kings from the hill country are joined forces against us. Oh, wow. Here are these guys that tricked them in to go against the promise of God 
to wipe out all the people. And yeah, they gave him the grace of being woodcutters and water bearers. But now they're getting attacked. You go, hey, you guys need to defend us. We're, you're, we're with you guys. They go, okay. I mean, sometimes you really get tested when you get your word. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like when you say at the water's baptism, Jesus is Lord. Whoa, that's tough to do. That's the challenge, isn't it? And you know, a lot of times, you know, what's very interesting, there's a, there's a thing that a lot of people think, well, you know, the longer that you're in Christ, the easier it gets. No, 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 not a lot of people think that. Particularly baby Christians. Oh, I can't wait till I'm an older Christian and it's real easy to be a disciple. That's like saying to a marathon runner, man, I bet the 20th mile is a breeze compared to that first one. Dang, have you pulled oh, you hit that wall? I mean, that's why it takes so much to be a disciple of Jesus. Every year, Satan tries to trick us and make a treaty with us to compromise our convictions. And as disciples, once we take that oath, Jesus is Lord, there is no turning back. For whatever reason. For whatever reason. It may get tough. It may at times seem impossible. Those close to you may try to stop you. But bottom line, you made an oath to God at the waters of baptism. Jesus is Lord. Just like right here. Joshua and the Israelites said, listen. Yeah, you're part of us. We made a treaty. Okay, you can come and be a part of our community. Oh, yeah, you get the lowliest positions. Oh, no, now you're being attacked? Okay, we'll defend you, and we'll bring even our best guys. Is that awesome? Is that awesome? Keep reading. Verse 7. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to stand, withstand you. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took him by surprise. I mean, wow. I mean, Joshua was an incredible general, an incredible leader of God's people. And in order to effect a great victory right here, he called upon God's people not just to go the extra mile, but to go the extra miles all night. Do we have... Boundaries and limits to say, well, I'm going to be just as committed, but not anymore. See, a sold-out disciple says, listen, I'll go anywhere, do anything, give up everything. And what made Joshua a great leader is he inspired all of God's people to push themselves beyond what many of them thought that they could do. They marched all night. Joshua surprises them. And, you know, you catch an army off guard. Oh my goodness, it's awesome. Let's keep watching. Verse 10. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. Very interesting here. The word confusion in Hebrew is disturbed. It says literally, in the Hebrew it says, and the Lord disturbed them. See, that's often what the Lord does when he wants our attention. He disturbs us. Have you been disturbed this week? Have you been disturbed for a few months? That's the Lord. It's not the circumstances. It's not the, that's the Lord disturbing. Say, hey, hey, I need your attention. Hey, right over here. What happens? Israel pursued them along the road, going to Beth Horon, and cut them down all the way to Aska and Mekidah. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon, to Ascola, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky, and more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the sword of the Israelites. Well, now the writer of the book right here wants us to be very sure that we understand that the victory was accomplished by God more than by men. And he says, hey, you know, there was this huge storm that was there, and all of a sudden, in the midst of this confusion that's being wrought, there are gigantic hailstones that the Lord, literally he says, is hurling down from heaven. You know, as I was, I was, I was studying last night, I, I go, I wonder what the record is for a hailstorm. I mean, 
it never crossed my mind to seek out the answer before. How big could big be? So I got on my trusty internet. <laughs> Went to National Geographic. This is, I'm not kidding you. June of 2003 in Nebraska. Wow. Nebraska, just, just four years ago, is the record hailstones. They were seven inches in diameter, 19 inches in circumference. They're the size of soccer balls, and hailstones can go faster when they come down from the heavens than 100 miles an hour. How would you like one of them to hit you? <laughs> you know, a lot of us think these little dinko hailstones come down. Oh, man, those guys, they have a boom. See, they'll go boom, boom, boom. Come, wow, this is cranking. Can you imagine me an Israelite seeing the Lord fight for you? Man, this is awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. It gets better. Amen, guys? Let's read on right here. Verse 12. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as is written in the book of Joshua. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There's never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. It was just obvious God was with his people. Amen? Now right here, there are two thoughts about this passage. The first thought is basically that the sun stood there in the sky allowing the Israelites the extra time to defeat all of these people. I mean, you've got to imagine the moment. They're coming out of the darkness of night. They've surprised the enemy. A huge storm gathers. And we're talking cranky storm. Those, those, you know, it'd been pretty black crowd, clouds to have hailstones that big. You know what I'm talking about? And then just as, just as this hailstorm has wiped out so many of the enemies of God's people, it passes the sun, starts breaking over the clouds. I mean, you've got to admit, that's a breathtaking view. The sun is there. It's shining. And right here it says it just stayed there so the Israelites could get all the rest of the guys. And the Bible simply says, hey, God listened to a man that day. It was obvious God was with his people. Another thought is that these words are indeed the words of a song, but it's a hyperbole. It's a, it's a bit of an exaggeration. The Hebrew in the first line of the song, O sun, stand still, the words right there actually is, be dumb, <laughs> or be silent. In other words, do not cease to shine. So they're saying, okay, the sun didn't physically set still, but it's, Lord, okay, now the storm has passed. Don't let the sun cease to shine. We need to see our enemies. And then later on it says, the sun stops in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. The word there literally in the Hebrew is, a, this was a perfect day. Just like in the Greek, when we talk about someone being mature, complete, or perfect. They're all synonymous in the Greek, okay? Amen? So he's saying it was just the perfect day. The clouds had this incredible storm. Hail came, destroyed many people, throwing the people to pieces. Then the sun comes on out. Sun don't cease to shine. And while the sun was shining, they got all the rest of the people. Anyway, victory for God was won that day. I believe the first one, but amen. You got your choice right on that. <laughs> Hailstones or hail Jehovah, there are only two kinds of people on the battlefield that day. Only two kinds of people. I believe there are only two kinds of people today. Those that got hailstones coming at them and those who hail Jehovah. And you know, some of us have been hit by a couple hailstones. It hurts! Yeah, the Lord wants your attention right there. He doesn't like you being against him. You know, we've got to understand that if we're going to hail Jehovah, we need prayers that dare. I mean, can you imagine Joshua just praying to defeat this whole new confederacy? All these armies? It's incredible. 
And then to go at it with all of his heart and have all of his guys march all night. And then the Lord to bring about a great victory. You know, as I was considering this passage, I thought about some of the toughest prayers that I believe that we need to pray. Prayers that dare are prayers about our physical family. You know, a lot of times when things aren't right in our physical family, that's where Satan can get us with those spiritual errors. And our, our faith goes down. You know what I'm talking about? It's when our husband doesn't follow. Or when our wife isn't with it. Or our children aren't there. But you know, it's been so exciting seeing the Lord work in just a few short weeks that the church here has come together. I mean, I mean, Kathy Martinez just shared Tuesday at our staff meeting that she's been praying for her mom, Sandra, for 16 years to come back to the Lord, and she's come back to the Lord now. Amen? I mean, it was awesome. Yeah. Lance and Connie Underhill came on down on the mission team from Portland down to L.A. a lot because their son Michael was down here. But Connie says, I just prayed every day that God would bring Michael back. And Michael got restored last week. Amen, church? I mean, it's, it's been incredible to be able to see families like the Anakeas and the McGee's see their sons baptized in the Christ when seemingly they were so far out there. Are you with me now? You see, sometimes we, 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 we have this feeling that, oh man, it, God can work in other people's lives, in other people's lives, but in my family, they're so derelict. I mean, they're in such tough situations, they'll never come around. My dad is too old. My mom is too old. They live out in Timbuktu. They'll never... you got to start praying prayers that dare. Are you with me right here, church? You know, I remember early on, I, I became a Christian at 17. And uh, I, I was zealous for the Lord. And after being a Christian for a little while, I go, man, I need a Christian girlfriend. <laughs> but I looked around the fellowship... And in my, in my arrogance, I didn't see anybody good enough. Now, hold it. Don't tell me you haven't been there. <laughs> Don't tell me that. I mean, some of you sat in church of thousands and it wasn't nobody good enough for you. My advice, look in the mirror. But you know... I, I, I began to feel hopeless. And, and that's very scary. When you start thinking there's nobody there for you in the fellowship, because what you start doing is you look, start looking in the world for a girlfriend. Or you start looking in the world for a boyfriend. And those are the kind of people that take you out. See, that's why the Bible says, you know, bad company corrupts good character. Our best friends need to be in the church. And when you're picking a boyfriend or a girlfriend, absolutely they need to be a disciple. And so then, a few months later, the Holy Spirit brought Elena to the church. She had a boyfriend at the time. A few months later, Elena studied and was baptized. Her boyfriend studied, didn't make it. That, that was sad, but... <laughs> two months after that, we had our first date. And of course, this next week, we celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary. You see... You gotta have prayers that dare. When I was uh, a young student, I got this dream to be a campus minister because my life had been affected when I was a college student. I said, "Man, I want to be a minister." Now we realize that there are different talents in the body of Christ, and some are called into the ministry and some are not. But we're all called to be ministers of reconciliation. Amen. But I felt in particular the Lord was calling me, and so I had a dream to be a campus minister and. And back in those days, the dream was to have a campus ministry at every campus in the United States. That was the limitation to the dream. There was no dream to have churches of sold-out disciples. There was no dream to evangelize the world. But at least there was that vision to go to all the campuses. I said, man, if we're going to go to a campus, I want to go to Harvard. I want to be campus minister at Harvard. And I prayed. Well, when I graduated from school, there was no opportunity. So I went to Philadelphia there for a year. Fell flat on my face. Then I went three years to Charleston, Illinois, city of a whopping 18,000 people, 9,000 on the college there, Eastern Illinois University. But with 9,000 kids, we baptized 300 college students. There were 45 disciples in one dorm, Carmel Hall. I've never heard of anything like it. 
During those years were years of training and testing. And then the door opened to go to Boston. It allowed me to be the camps minister at Harvard. And my dream came in God's timing. But you have to have prayers that dare. I remember being 30 years old, and I said, man, I'm so old. But then I found the scripture. Jesus began his ministry at 30. I go, now that's a cranking scripture. And I remember being in Paris, and the church was not there yet. And I told Elena, I said, let me, I, I need to go up the shop. Please. I want to pray under the Ark of Triumph. I'll never forget that night. I went up there, and I just prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, you bring a church to this city of lights. Lord, use me in any way. Humble me in any way. When you pray that, that's, oh boy. <laughs> to allow me to be used to see the world evangelized. How about it? When was the last time you prayed a prayer to dare? You know, we prayed even before all the kids were born for the kids to become disciples. And they did. Now they drifted from the Lord and we're praying they're going to come on back. Amen, guys? You know, I prayed for all my kids to get into Harvard. Say, now, that's a cranking prayer, particularly when you go to the University of Florida. <laughs> it's not exactly the same level right there. You know what I'm talking about? All three got into Harvard. Well, one of them chose not to go, but he got in. Prayers that dare. I prayed at one time. That the church could be in the Rose Bowl. The cotton pick and Rose Bowl. And we did it. 17,000. I prayed that we would have the most baptisms we ever had in one month. We had 460 people baptized in Christ. Granted, there were things we did wrong in that day. But God gave us those victories. And God honored our prayers. I remember when I went through a hard time. I was invited by a friend to go out to North Carolina. And I remember sitting on the shore in a place called Cape Fear. Where the waters of the river and the waters of the ocean collide together. And I saw my life as just being churned up. And there I wrote a song. Like David's Psalm 51 about being restored to the Lord. At that point, I was restored to the Lord. And I told, Lord, use me any way you can to rebuild your kingdom. We need to pray prayers that dare. I remember when things got so bleak that Elena and I were not even wanted for the ministry. And then this dinky little church up in Portland, Oregon says, hey, how about you guys come up here? I'm looking around and going, well, not seeing a whole lot of other bids going on right here. <laughs> You know, honestly, I didn't even ask how much they're going to pay because I thought, well, at least I'll get something, you know. <laughs> we literally had to spend down uh, some of our retirement in order to stay in the ministry. But that's how important it was for us to serve, to serve. And then the Lord blessed us being there. And the Lord putting on our hearts last fall to start a new movement that would evangelize the world in a generation. See, I figured, well, okay. It's been about 25 years. Amen. We fell short. If the good Lord blesses me, I got about 25 more. And prayerfully, I'm a lot smarter this time around. A lot more humble. And we're praying a prayer to dare to see the world evangelized. Yeah, prayers that dare. Because they build your faith, and then you want to pray more prayers that dare. You see, that in and of itself is the saga of the Gibeonites. Thanks, and God bless.